All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, today's topic is going to be the FMLA mental health and state leave programs. I'm really looking forward to talking about this. It's very topical. Um, employers, you know, in, in every, every industry, tra transportation is no exception, um, are dealing with um, all kinds of struggles, whether it be finding the right talent, turnover, retention, all of that. And um, to further complicate things, businesses are also, um, and their workers are also struggling, and there are just a huge complex web of, of different laws and leaves and other programs that might apply on a situational basis. Um, and now, really more than ever, really since the pandemic, mental health has become a focus and really become an issue for for many more employees than it had been previously. Um, so navigating how mental health applies when it comes to things like FMLA and state leave programs only complicates things further. So hopefully today we can weed through some of that and, and leave you feeling confident on how to address these situations should they ever present themselves in your workplace. So those of you who don't know, MP um, has been working with the New England Livery Association for, for quite some time now. We're a full service human capital management company. We offer everything from payroll to HR, consultative services, benefits administration, time and attendance, um, and compliance. Um, should you want any more information about our company, feel free um, to go to our website there. We also have an exclusive landing page and website um, for the New England Livery Association where you can access all of our resources, our webinars, our content, and also ask HR questions to be answered by one of our team of HR professionals. So I encourage you to take advantage of that. So my name is Paul Corellis. I am the VP of HR Services and Tax Credit Services here at MP. I'm going in my 10th year at the company um, and really truly enjoy working with businesses of all shapes and sizes of industries to help them not only be compliant, but also um, be the employer that they want to be. Quick legal disclaimer, um, we'll be talking about some some legal matters and seriously some very sensitive topics, but um, this is coming from an HR best practices standpoint um, and should not be construed as legal advice. So what we are going to cover, we're going to do an overview of, of the FMLA. Um, it's really important to familiarize yourself with that. So often we'll talk to businesses and clients who just assume that they have to be compliant and subject to the FMLA when in fact they don't, or maybe a specific employee is, is not eligible for FMLA leave. So uh, it's important to understand that to know whether or not you need to worry about it at all. We'll also talk about intermittent F FMLA. So um, it's a bit of a nuanced program, but basically rather than someone taking all of their FMLA time off at once, that um, it may be here and there, or even for portions of a day. We'll talk about the intersection of FMLA when it comes to mental health, as well as the intersection with FMLA and state leave laws, um, especially just knowing um, the attendees today, um, we'll talk about the Massachusetts specific paid family medical leave because there are a lot of parallels there. Um, we'll also talk about notice requirements if you are subject to FMLA and also open things up to Q&A should you have any questions at all. So please don't be shy. If you do have a question, please just type it in the Q&A, um, hit the Q&A button on the Zoom and uh, type your questions there. Hopefully I'll have an answer on the spot. If not, we'll be sure to follow up with you and get you an, an adequate response. All right, so first let's talk about FMLA. So what FMLA essentially does is provide eligible employees up to 12 work weeks of unpaid leave each year. So um, if they have a qualifying health condition or need to care for someone with a qualifying health condition, um, they're, they're kind of granted up to 12 work weeks of, of leave, but it is unpaid. If you have a group health plan and that employee taking FMLA is a participant in your group health insurance, um, you do need to keep them on the plan while they are on FMLA leave. When someone returns, and sometimes this is tricky and it's, and it's usually very specific, employees need to be returned to the same or an equivalent job. So um, we've seen the law come down pretty hard on employers who take liberties with that equivalent definition. So. It can mean many things. Really, you want to make sure that A, obviously the pay is the same, 
B, the level of responsibility and, and C, the geography as well. So, um, you know, we've worked with multi-unit restaurant groups, for instance, where they might return someone to the same position, but it might be at a different location. Um, that would generally be a no-no. It might be that the that employee was on the bus line for that specific location, or it might otherwise um, cause some kind of adverse effect on their employment if they have, are reporting to a different location. Also, um, in in roles like transportation, certainly manufacturing things like that, you want to be mindful of the shift as well. So, if someone had been working a day shift and all of a sudden they're they're switched to overnight, um, even if the job is the same, it would not necessarily be considered equivalent for FMLA purposes and your requirement to return them to an equivalent job. Um, so this is this is the big one here. Um, FMLA applies to all public agencies as well as private employers that have 50 or more employees. So if you've crossed that threshold recently, there's there's a time limit. I believe it's 20 weeks in the previous 12 months that you had over 50 employees. Um, but if you're under 50 employees, you do not have to worry about the federal FMLA. The tune will be different when we talk about state leaves, but for purposes of federal, you're okay. So companies with 50 or more employees are subject but who amongst their workforce could potentially be eligible for FMLA? So to be eligible for FMLA, an employee has to work for an FMLA covered employer. And they also have to have worked at least 1,250 hours during the previous 12 months before taking the leave. They also have to have worked for the employer for at least 12 months. So if someone's only been employed for you for six months, eight months, um, you do not need to grant them FMLA leave. They are not yet eligible. And then also, and this, this gets tricky, especially in this day and age, um, they need to work at a location where the employer has 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. So if you have someone working at a satellite location and there aren't at least 50 people there, um, then they may not be eligible for FMLA. So you could, conceivably be in a situation where because you have 50 or more employees, um, you're a subject employer, but you might not actually have any employees who are eligible for FMLA leave because they're spread out at, at different satellite locations all over the place. Um, speaking of being spread out all over the place, um, the Department of Labor did weigh in when it comes to remote employees. And obviously this is a very hot topic now more than ever. Um, companies are hiring people remotely, they're working from home, a lot of times they're working out of state and certainly beyond the, the traditional 75 mile radius that we use to measure for FMLA purposes. So this is how um, the labor code has weighed in and I'll just read this verbatim and we can decipher it as needed after. An employee's personal residence is not a work site in case of employees, such as salespeople who travel a sales territory and who generally leave to work and return from work to their personal residence, or employees who work at home as under the concept of a flexi place or telecommuting. Rather, their work site is the office to which they report and from which assignments are made. So, you know, if you have a dispatcher or something like that, that that works remotely. Um, if they're receiving their assignments from your home office, they should probably be counted as working at that work location. All right, so what are some of the qualifying conditions that may occur to an employee that opens them up to be eligible for FMLA leave? First, the birth of a child. Uh, also the placement of a child for adoption or foster care. Caring for an immediate family member with a otherwise serious health condition, one of the things that would qualify them as an employee themselves. Um, an employee who is unable to work because of that serious health condition themselves, or there are also qualifying military exigencies. So um, if, they're, if the employee or a member of their immediate family is an active military member um, and needs care, that's also covered by FMLA. All right, so we, we've thrown around the term serious health condition. It's important to really give that a proper definition for purposes of FMLA. So things that are considered serious health conditions are either a condition that requires an overnight stay in a hospital or a similar medical care facility, a condition that 
without the overnight hospital stay, otherwise incapacitates an employee or a family member for more than three days and also requires ongoing medical treatment. Um, another option is a chronic condition that causes occasional periods when the employee or a family member is incapacitated and requires treatment by a healthcare provider at least twice a year. So some things like that could be everything from severe asthma, um, a heart condition, um, you know, other, other similar chronic conditions. And then pregnancy can also be considered a, a serious health condition when there are complications. So as part of the FMLA process, when someone applies for the leave, as an employer, you're allowed to require a, a certification from a healthcare provider um, that substantiates the claim. You do need to give them at least 15 calendar days for them to get that. So you can't say, hey, today's Tuesday. If you're going to take this FMLA leave, we need that doctor's note by Friday. You have to give at least 15 calendar days, so essentially three weeks. Uh, excuse me, two weeks. It's calendar days, not business days. If the employer determines that the certification is incomplete or, or not up to standard, um, you do need to give the employee a reasonable opportunity to cure the deficiency. You just can't say, this doesn't tell me enough, we're denying the leave. Um, if it's uncertain, if things are left blank, um, you need to send that back for clarification. And then aside from, from the doctor's note and the certification, you cannot require the employee to give, give you their you know, complete medical file or medical records. It, it should be limited to that. That letter, um, fitness for duty report, something similar from the doctor. Got to be really mindful of, of HIPAA regulations whenever we're dealing with an FMLA case and especially the, the medical substantiation piece. Um, you want to limit your direct contact with an employee's health care provider. So except in very extenuating circumstances, you don't, excuse me, want to necessarily be, be calling the doctor's office and asking for, for, for clarification. It's much preferred if you can work through the employee and get them to, to gather that information for you. Um, you want to be careful that you're consistent with this, but you can have a policy across the board where you require that employees submit a fitness for duty report or other types of certifications when they're coming back from FMLA leave um, to assure you that they're healthy, they're able to return, um, and what if any restrictions they have. You might want to be cautious with that sometimes. You know, that can further delay someone being out, them getting that necessary certification. Um, it, it might also delay when someone's ready to come back, their, their ability to do so if you have that requirement, but definitely something worth considering. If an employee doesn't submit their medical certification, um, you can deny, if as long as you've waited the appropriate timelines, you can deny the leave, you can um, delay it until they get it to you, but that puts the ball back in your court in terms of autonomy to, to manage the leave. Um, also, if you do require a fitness for duty certification um, and they fail to do so, you can delay their, their job restoration until they are able to furnish that. Um, FMLA is tricky in the sense that the decision making in terms of granting the leave, denying the leave, ending the leave, all of that is really in the hands of the employer. So um, can be really complex. As you know, things aren't, aren't black and white when it comes to HR and employee relations and, and running a business at the end of the day, right? So um, it can be really tricky and, and it is difficult because the onus is on you as the employer to you know, to handle these things, to make a determination, yes, do they meet the requirements? Are we going to grant the leave? Or no, do they fall short? Are they otherwise not eligible? Are we going to deny the leave? Um, how are we going to manage it? You know, the onus is also on employers, and I don't think we can really get into that too much in this presentation, but what the courts have shown over recent years is that when an employee has a serious health condition or has made it obvious and seems to need some time off or is taking time off or otherwise would potentially be a candidate for FMLA, the onus is really on the employer to recognize that and offer the FMLA leave. It's not a situation where if an employee should have been on FMLA and you terminate them for, for attendance issues or um, you know take other adverse action against them, we've seen many cases where 
you know, the defense of, well, they didn't ask for FMLA leave or they, they didn't request it, that's not held up in, in the court of law recently. So really the onus is on you, on your managers and supervisors, if you have that within your infrastructure to recognize potential FMLA scenarios when people are missing time and we know about some of their conditions that um, we need to be proactive with that. And that's that's something we we train our clients, managers and supervisors on is is on the ins and outs of FMLA a little bit more in depth than we can get into um, in today's a lot of time. But um, you do want to keep your eyes peeled for these situations. You'll see it's very different than, than while state leave has a lot more eligibility for for all kinds of folks. I think at least from a liability perspective, the nice thing is that the state makes those determinations about who's eligible and who isn't rather than putting that in your lap. All right, so let's talk a moment about intermittent FMLA leave, and this, this can be especially tricky. So when medically necessary, an employee can take FMLA leave um, on an intermittent or reduced schedule basis. Um, so rather than, again, having to take 12 weeks or up to 12 weeks all at once, there can be blocks of time. Um, they can reduce the time they work, either take a day here or there as needed, or um, maybe it's a half day because they have to go for some sort of treatment. If they have to go for dialysis or, you know, a cancer treatment, whatever it may be, um, but they're otherwise able to work, we need to work around that schedule to the best of our ability. So similarly, employees are able to use intermittent FMLA for their own serious health conditions as well as qualifying immediate family members. Um, and then also that same for the military members when they're active duty and, and need some care. The expectation legally is that employees should be making a reasonable effort to schedule their treatments outside of their work schedules. Um, you know, the onus is really on them to do that as much as possible. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, and in this specific situation, when an employee is taking intermittent leave um, and is needing some accommodation um, and some time away from work to take care of these things, this is the rare instance where um, an employee can be transferred on a temporary basis, not permanently, to an alternative job that may not be equivalent in terms of duties, pay, or benefits. Again, this is something I highly advise you to talk to an HR professional about, if not an attorney, should you be in this scenario and, and about to um, journey into a situation or an agreement like this, but uh, it is out there as a possibility. Okay, so here's a, a potential scenario that you know, we've seen some businesses run into. An employee named Mary has requested to take FMLA leave for a few half days every other week to care for her chronically sick child who suffers from bipolar. The time off Mary is requesting will be on occasion and mostly for doctor's appointments that she must take her child to. Is Mary eligible for intermittent FMLA leave? Yeah, in, in most cases, um, and we'll talk about um, mental health issues being uh, covered serious health condition. Um, but yeah, this, this would be a scenario where um, in order to care for the, the son or the child and get them to those appointments, this could be potentially an intermittent FMLA scenario, leave scenario that would be approved. All right, so let's talk about mental health for a moment. Um, definitely an issue that affects countless people around the world. Um, and obviously many of those people are employees of of companies, so um, something that enters the workplace on a daily basis. So in terms of interaction between those definitions of a serious health condition we talked about a few moments ago and how those might apply to mental health situations, um, inpatient care at an overnight stay in a hospital or other medical care facility. So obviously if someone is admitted or admits themselves um, because of mental health issues and they, they stay overnight at a facility, that would make it deemed a, a serious health condition. In terms of that continuing treatment, which can be a little bit more gray, again, conditions that in incapacitate an individual for more than three days, so if they're missing more than three days of work and require ongoing medical treatment. And then the other, a chronic condition that causes occasional periods 
where the individual is incapacitated and requires treatment by a healthcare provider at least twice a year. So uh, a lot of maladies and, and issues that people suffering from mental health deal with would fall into these categories. Certainly having to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist um, or another mental health medical professional, therapist, things like that could potentially be considered that continuing treatment. So also when this comes into play, certainly if the employee themselves is suffering from a mental health condition, um, if they have a caring for a family member who has a mental health condition, uh, as well as an adult child or um, caring for their loved one who's an active duty military member, um, you know, they're, they're by no means immune to, to mental health issues as well. All right, so here's a question for us. Can I use FMLA leave when I'm unable to work because of severe anxiety? I see a physician monthly for this condition to manage my symptoms. So the answer here is yes. Assuming that your employer is subject to FMLA, um, you can take leave if you're unable to work uh, because of a serious health condition. Uh, I, I'd say anxiety certainly has over time and through through case case precedent and things like that been considered a chronic condition. Um, and certainly for those of you who have ever suffered from anxiety, um, it can definitely be incapacitating, no doubt about it. So yeah, anxiety can definitely fall in under this realm and potentially be something that's FMLA eligible. All right, I use FMLA leave once a month for appointments with a mental health therapist. Is my employer required to keep my mental health condition confidential? Yes, definitely. Um, FMLA is by no means rolling out the red carpet for an employer to make the serious health conditions of their employees public, whether that be physical health issues or mental health issues. Um, all, all FMLA leave type matters should be kept separately in a confidential file. For those of you still using paper files, you want to keep those separate from the general personnel file. Um, for those of you using electronic records, um, hopefully your system has a separate separate tab or separate protections for a virtual confidential file. You do want to keep those separate from the general employee records that any manager or supervisor might be privy to or and or things that would factor into an employment decision whether or not to promote someone or demote someone or um, start disciplinary action with someone. Those sh that should be separate from FMLA information. Um, obviously, you, at the end of the day, you still need to run your business. You still need drivers on the road. You still need the dispatchers. You still need sales, all of that. So um, supervisors and managers can certainly be informed. You need to be, be away from work. Also, if you are returning to work, but you have covered restrictions or uh, accommodations under the ADA or whatever it may be, um, those can those can be obviously announced and, and factored in as well. All right, scenario three. My son sees a doctor for ADHD. After I used FMLA leave to take my son to a behavioral therapy appointment for this condition, my employer sent me an email informing me that I received a negative point on my attendance record. Can my employer punish me for using FMLA leave? So that is a no with a capital N. You, you really cannot take any adverse action against an employee when they're using their FMLA and as long as they're doing so honestly, excuse me, and not fraudulently, um, but really FMLA and someone's covered leave should not factor into everything from a hiring decision to a promotion um, or anything negative, demotion, write-up, termination, anything like that. Um, there are strict anti-retaliation rules within, within the um, FMLA regulations. All right, so that's kind of the, the federal point of view. Let's talk for a second about state leave. So depending on what state you operate in, you may be subject to to some of these or, or potentially even all of them. So 
Um, more and more states are adopting paid family medical leave programs. Some states also um, at this time are offering job protected unpaid leave. Um, many, many states now have mandatory earned sick time, which might come into play with this. Um, certainly employees can use sick time to help make up for the pay component that they don't get through federal FMLA. Um, many states also have domestic leave policies that give people time away to deal with domestic leave issues and sometimes be involved in court proceedings. Military leave is something that's available at the federal and state level oftentimes. Um, some states have separate disability leave policies and rules and regulations. Many states also have maternity and parental leave program. We can talk about that in a little bit. And then I'll say, I was about to say every, but there are a couple of states where workers comp is technically optional. Um, there are other rules and programs that they have to have in place, but um, it's safe to say that the majority of states have workers comp programs too, that if an employee is injured at work or has a serious health condition that's related to the job that they're doing, um, there may, may be interactions with workers comp laws as well as insurance. So when it comes to Massachusetts, um, and I'll talk about this for a second just because I know the concentration of, of attendees on the call as well as where I'm sitting at the moment, um, Massachusetts has its own paid family medical leave law. This started up um, in terms of the leave being available back in 2021. So we're um, entering year three of this. But in a nutshell, um, this is, this is we'll, we'll go over a chart in a second, but this is different from FMLA, um, but oftentimes runs concurrently with FMLA. It does have a paid component to it. Not paid by you, paid by the state, but still paid to the employee. So in terms of what's available under the state program, family leave to bond with a child or to care to a family member with a serious health condition. So that's up to 12 weeks. So that can be everything from, um, we'll talk about a mother giving birth in a second because they, they get to take advantage of a couple of these. But um, if there is a father who has a baby, um, they can take up to 12 weeks of bonding leave. It doesn't have to be right when the baby's born. It just has to be completed before the baby turns one. Also, if they have to care, otherwise care for a family member that has a serious health condition, they can take up to 12 weeks for that instead. For an employee's and their own serious health conditions that they have themselves, um, it can be up to 20 weeks of leave. Ultimately, that's determined by, by the medical professional and what they state is needed. Um, for those with uh, family members in active military that need to care for, for those individuals, there's up to 26 weeks of leave available. And then when you combine all three of those programs and in, in any given benefit year, no one employee can take more than 26 weeks of PFML through the state of Massachusetts or an equivalent um, private plan. So when we talk about a, a birthing mother, um, they'll, they'll generally get some medical leave. So for the birth and the recovery from that, um, again, ultimately that's up to the doctor. What we're typically seeing in for a, a standard delivery is usually around eight weeks. So they get the eight weeks and then they can also take 12 weeks of that bonding leave. So essentially for in Massachusetts, um, for a birthing, birthing parent, they can generally take um, 20 weeks in most cases now. So unlike the FMLA where employees had to have 1,250 hours of work, have to work at a workplace with 50 or more employees in a 75 mile radius, um, and have to have been employed for at least 12 months, those all go out the window in, in Massachusetts PFML as well as several other states that have paid family medical leave. So all W-2 workers whose workplace is in Massachusetts, whether they're full-time, part-time, seasonal, what have you, they're all potentially eligible for paid family medical leave. Um, the place of work is what's really important. This comes up a lot. So if you're a company um, in New Hampshire or in Vermont, and that's where the employee is working, even if they're commuting from Massachusetts and they're a Massachusetts resident, um, they wouldn't be eligible for PFML. It's all about where they work. Conversely, if you have someone driving down from New Hampshire and working in Massachusetts, 
um, they would be eligible even though they're not a Massachusetts resident because their workplace is Massachusetts. Um, the one other test is that in the previous 12 months, they have to have wages on file of at least $5,400. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be through you as the employer. They just have to have that from somewhere. So um, you can have someone who starts on the job and two weeks in, they have a baby or contract a serious health condition, what have you, and, and you could be out that worker for, you know, say up to 20 weeks or more. And again, double-edged sword, but unlike FMLA, this program is dictated by the state. So the employee obviously lets you know that they need to leave, but they apply for PFML through the state of Massachusetts, and the state is the determining factor in terms of whether the leave is granted or not, um, and what the, the time frame of that is going to be. So let's kind of quickly take a look at a comparison of the federal program and the state, at least here in Massachusetts. So both protect both offer job protected leave. So while someone is out on the leave, they can't be otherwise terminated. Um, there are some exceptions to this that you're really going to want to talk to someone about if, if you're considering terminating someone who's on FMLA. It's very, very risky and very dicey. There are certain re requirements and hoops you want to make sure you jump through to make sure that that doesn't get you in a lot of hot water. There's also protection under both programs against retaliation. The Massachusetts ones is especially spiky. Um, for the six months after someone returns to work under Massachusetts PFML, if they're terminated, it's automatically assumed that it's retaliatory and you have to, the burden of proof is on you as the employer to prove otherwise. So be mindful of that. Both programs do require you to continue any group health insurance that the employee is on while they're on the leave. Again, um, all Massachusetts employers essentially are subject to PFML, unlike the FMLA. PFML does provide pay where FMLA doesn't. Again, that's not coming out of your, your pocket or your payroll account. It is being issued by the state. Um, it's based on a percentage of their, their earnings in the look back period and caps at $850 a week. Um, one nice thing is that this program you know, everybody, all employers pay the same rate. Um, it doesn't matter if you've had zero claims or 100 claims in the past year. It's not like unemployment. Um, they kind of pool all the funds from all of the employers when they determine their rates each year. And actually this year in 2023, the rates went down slightly, which means that um, the program is, is adequately funded. Um, again, we talked about the eligibility a, a few minutes ago. Um, under FMLA, technically, you can require employees to use their paid time off, um, if you so wish, to provide some pay while they're on that unpaid leave. Um, you cannot have that requirement in Massachusetts. There is a seven-day waiting period before the paid component of PFML kicks in, so many times if employees have it available, they will want to use sick or PTO to cover that, that seven-day wait, um, but you cannot require it. I think we talked about the leave allotments themselves plenty. Um, and then also, and this is really important to factor in too, um, especially if you are a larger employer and subject to both, FMLA has a very limited list in terms of a covered family member and, and who you can be caring for to be covered under FMLA. So it's really restricted to spouse, parent, or child. Um, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, anything like that are, are not eligible family members if someone needs to care for them under FMLA. Um, as you can see here on the screen, the state's program has a much longer list of potential family members that could be covered. So that list is spouse, parent, child, domestic partner, parent of domestic partner, grandchild, grandparent, or sibling. So um, we, we have seen that before where um, an employee has, has needed to care for a brother or sister. Um, was not eligible under FMLA for that because it's not a covered family member, but was eligible for PFML. So whenever you're present, presented with a leave of absence scenario, someone needs to take leave, you know, for whatever reason, they come to your office or you get a call from a doctor's office or God forbid an emergency room and realize you've, you've got a situation where someone's going to be missing some time. You want to first determine which leave of absence laws apply. You know, am I an FMLA employer? If so, there's some required paperwork that goes along with it. 
Uh, am I not, do I, I grant the leave, is this a situation where they might have earned sick time that they can use? Is this something where I need to get them information for ap applying for, for um, paid family medical leave with the state? Um, what am I subject to? What is the employee potentially eligible for? Um, you then want to review the company policies, procedures, and practices, both internally as well as with the employee making the request. All right, so when you run into a situation where someone is eligible for both, how much time does the employee actually have for leave? So generally speaking, you got to give whatever is to the greater benefit of the employee. So, you know, if they can take 12 weeks under PFML, uh, but the FMLA is going to run out after 12 weeks, then they get the 20 weeks under PFML. One important thing to have in your handbook and your policies and communicated to the employee when they're entering a leave in a scenario like that is you want to make it very clear, both in policy and in practice, that these leave laws run concurrently whenever applicable. So what you want to avoid happening is someone taking 12 weeks of FMLA leave and then for the same condition, taking another 26 weeks of PFML leave. Um, so you want to make it very clear that that leave runs concurrently and can't be stacked like that. So in addition to leave laws, um, there are other protections that employees have um, that can come into play oftentimes with FMLA. So as I said, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, that'll generally be speaking when someone is looking to come back um, or you know, might, might not be eligible for FMLA leave for whatever reason, but does want to continue working. What you have to do in that case is determine are they able to complete the primary functions of the job? Taking a look at, excuse me, your job description. If they are, what reasonable accommodations need to be made to, in order for them to do so? Do those accommodations cause an undue hardship on the business? So, you know, if, if we're talking about a, uh, a limousine driver or a van driver and they lose their vision, they go blind, you know, there's, there's no ADA accommodation that's going to allow them to continue in that role as a driver. There's just no way about it. Similarly, if they develop some sort of, say, seizure condition that they lose their license, um, they're not a licensed driver, that's not an ADA situation. There's Certainly, we can approach it that way, but there's not going to be a reasonable accommodation that can be made. Certainly, if, if you wish, you can explore other potential openings for those workers that they, they might fit into, but really under the ADA, the onus is on you, really, um, and the employee in terms of continuing that current role and the primary functions of that current role. You're not required to create a new position for them by any means. Um, USARA has to do with, with, with the military leave. ERISA and HIPAA have to do with, with information um, and, and data privacy. Um, so just be mindful of those things as, as you go through this. And again, um, know that we do have that website set up um, through MP and through um, NILA, where if you run into a sticky situation, you, you have a question or want to know how best to approach it, or even just need the most current versions of FMLA paperwork, um, shoot a request in that in that web page. It's mp-hr.com slash N-E-L-A. Um, and you can pose your question right there, and, and one of our HR professionals will be happy to help you navigate that. Um, when you have a situation, an employer is allowed to require an employee to substitute accrued paid leave, um, vacation time, or any combination of the above while they're on the FMLA leave. Again, um, if they're strictly taking PFML, you cannot, but if it's also FMLA leave, you potentially can. Um, this would more come into play in other states where there isn't a paid family medical leave component, so you just want to be mindful of that. One other thing to always keep in mind um, as you're approaching these situations, there's kind of two things at play. There's income replacement. So that's things like paid family medical leave in Massachusetts, but also if you're somewhere else or it's otherwise not applicable, things like short-term disability insurance, long-term disability insurance, other benefits that, that may be offered by the company, sometimes at little to no cost to the employees. Those are all income replacement. So that has to do with the money. 
um, you have to separately look at the job protected leave. So things like maternity leave, domestic violence leave, uh, FMLA, those are leave laws. So there's no pay component to it, um, but those are the things more more often than not that, that get employers into trouble because there are legal protections to those employees' positions while they're away. We need to, and it's easier said than done, um, believe me, I, I understand and realize that, especially for companies that are kind of just over that line or um, have people working very specialized jobs. Uh, it can be tough to hold on to that position, but um, it, it, the, the, the law does require it. So you have to do some strategic planning when you do have people out um, to ensure that you'll be able to return them to something equivalent when they are ready to do so. All right. So, um, final scenarios for you. An employee named Amy is struggling with an eating disorder and must stay in the hospital for a two week period for treatment. After Amy returns to work, she'll then need time off for ongoing therapy appointments. Is Amy eligible for FMLA? Uh, yeah, provided she meets the other FMLA requirements in terms of uh, employee size at her company um, and her, her tenure and hours worked. Definitely, she's um, this has required an overnight stay. Um, also, missed more than three days. There is some ongoing treatment that's required. So, um, definitely there. When it comes to FMLA, there, as I said, there are some very specific forms and paperwork that you need to go through when you enter into these scenarios. First of which is a general notice. So if you have a labor law poster up, there should be something about FMLA on there um, that needs to be in there. If you're of a size where you're subject to FMLA, you wanna have a FMLA policy in your handbook as well. Um, so just make sure you have that somewhere so that it can be said that when people start, they are notified about um, the general notice and the, the rules and regulations of FMLA. Now, when someone makes a request for leave, or, and again, this is where it gets tricky in terms of legal responsibilities, when the employer knows that an employee is on leave and it may be for an FMLA qualifying reason, potentially, you've got five business days to give them an eligibility notice. So um, <clears throat> they put in their claim, you have that time frame for them to get the medical certification. And then once the determination has been made, you need to then let them know whether you're granting the FMLA leave or whether you're denying it. Um, and if you ultimately determine that they're not eligible, you need to say why. And eligibility notices do generally have the, the reason. So sometimes it's as simple as checking a box. You did not work 1,250 hours in the last 12 months. Um, you've not been employed here for at least 12 months. You do not work. Um, within a 75 mile radius or 50 or more employees um, or the, you know the whatever the malady is may not be considered a serious health condition. So when when someone is granted um, you do need to also furnish a rights and responsibilities notice. This does have to be in writing and these are all the things that it must include. Um, that they're on leave it may be counted as FMLA leave. You need to define what your 12 month period is. So whether you use the calendar year, another 12 month period, your benefit year, your, your fiscal year, or whether you define it based on the start date of their leave and measure 12 months from there, just so that you can know that, you know, one, have they exhausted their 12 weeks and when they do, when they'll be eligible for an additional up to 12 weeks of FMLA leave, is that gonna be based on calendar year, benefit year or usage? So that needs to be defined and in writing. You want to be clear in terms of your expectations and requirements for their health certification. Um, there is standard language about an employee's right um, for substitution of paid leave, whether or not you're going to require that as allowed under FMLA. You do want to have instructions for how what your expectations are in terms of keeping them on their, the health insurance, whether you're going to expect them to make monthly payments directly to you, whether it's something that you'll be comfortable reconciling once they return to work. You do want to kind of spell that out in the rights and responsibilities notice. 
And then you also need to put in the assurances of their job restoration um, and that they won't be dropped from the health insurance while they're on the FMLA. All right, so hopefully that gave you a, um, a general idea of the responsibilities as of FMLA subject employers, as well as other employers where state leaves may come into play in conjunction with or instead of FMLA. Um, as I said, I, I greatly encourage you to reach out to us to any questions. Um, the MP NILA website has some really great resources, all kinds of similar training topics and webinars um, on everything from state laws to federal laws to um, how to really optimize your workforce. So encourage you to, to check those out and also um, don't lose sleep over these HR questions. We're here to help. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, our HR team um, are certified HR professionals and we're, we're, we really enjoy working with, with clients and with businesses and, and helping them out. So, so please don't be shy. But other than that, I hope you have an awesome afternoon and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much.